are nowhere. You can, whatever you see, opportun opportunities are nowhere or opportunities are now here. Are now here. <laughs> yes. You can, you can always read, you can, and it has to do with um, what you see. And basically that is what to do with the also investments, that the opportunities are always there. It has to do with your ability to see those opportunities. And that's why I say, uh, we read that resources have never been scarce, only resourceful minds are. And in the dimension of resourceful mindset, is the ability to be able to see those opportunities and respond to them. And so the starting point is evaluating where do you want to be as an endowment fund? And um, evaluate where you are at the moment and where do you want to be? And how do you want to get there? And what do you, what do you why do you, uh, more importantly answer, why do you want to get there? And what do you have at hand? And what are some of the risks that may affect your ability to achieve those desired goals as regards to investments into the future? Um, and the whole idea around uh, investments is that to have more assets, basically assets are, according to Robert Kiyosaki, an asset is anything that generates cash flow your way. Liabilities are anything that take cash away from you. Maybe at this point, and we add examples of assets you can think of. We can add them on the, um, so that we make this engaging. Let me see. Examples of assets. We can chat examples of assets. Bire, can you? I hope I am being heard. Yes, we can hear you. Examples of assets like land, including Chitai, Bonfes, clapping for you. Any other? How about um, uh, a husband in your house? Do you think a husband is can be an asset or a liability? And and how about uh, a wife? <laughs> okay, if a husband brings cash to your pocket, then maybe he's a, an asset. On a light note, <laughs> and uh, if a wife takes uh, brings cash to your pocket, then uh, then maybe is also she can be also an asset. But generally speaking, do you think uh, men are generally assets or liabilities? Let me see that, those charts. Oh. I want this to be a little bit more fun and engaging. Because I can see Bonfell Sikuku saying that vehicles can be assets if they are bringing cash, okay? Anyway, uh, in summary, what I, it, through investment, you are ensuring that the assets you have it generate more income, uh, compared to having uh, and, and having less expenses uh, because uh, uh, liabilities take, uh, they take away value from the uh, trust. So uh, again, by way of recap, an endowment is basically a set of funds um, available, usually then donated by an in individual and this is held in a legal entity uh, to generate in perpetuity uh, some form of revenue uh, towards realization of certain objectives that will have been provided in the uh, statutes that establish the endowment entity. And the process we say it is you create, you fund. Uh, so today, after creating and funding it, we are looking at how can we then ensure that we generate cash through investment so that we can distribute and spend towards uh, certain courses that you have put in place um, defined within the endowment fund. And um, this could be community impact, 
uh, maybe in various uh, spaces of impact, can be healthcare, can be education, can be climate change, can be agri, can be women economic empowerment, and various sustainability causes that you have come up in place. Um, the often uh, model that you may consider, uh, and, and this can be adapted, is you have funds sit with a custodian in a nominee account. And why nominee assets is that nominee assets do not form part of the uh, custody, uh, custodial bank. And the benefit of that is that because they are of the balance sheet of that bank, even if the bank collapses, the assets are still safeguarded. Then you have the fund manager. So the work of the fund manager is to, appointed fund manager is to invest uh, the funds in line with the, with the um, in line with the investment policy that you have developed, that you have put in place. Um, and then you have a financial analyst or advisor who develops the investment policy independently and that investment policy is discussed by the trustees of the endowment uh, so that the, 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 the investment performance benchmarks are discussed and agreed with the fund manager. And so the investment policy then becomes a roadmap that guides how the investments are going to be uh, handled by the fund manager. Then you have the investment accountant stock administrator who is independent. Both of these institutions, they would then report to the uh, trustees of the endowment uh, periodically on quarterly basis. Uh, you can also have a lawyer who then works around governance, secretarial uh, uh, compliance of the endowment. And then the auditor who does the audit of the endowment annually. This is just a sample uh, governance matrix, and I'm not saying you must take this. I do take cognizance. Uh, I do appreciate that there can always be variability uh, of how this can be handled, and you can always adapt to what you feel would work best for you. But I have seen in some cases this works well because you have dependency, that the assets are sitting separate from the uh, entity, the legal entity that has set up the endowment, sitting with the custodial bank. And then two, you have a fund manager who often will be regulated by capital markets authority, whose work is to undertake research and provide uh, selection of securities that are aligned to the um, institution's uh, risk appetite and uh, desired uh, return. And then you have an independent entity that handles investment accounting. Sometimes um, the administrator provides bookkeeping, can also provide financial uh, anal uh, investment advisory services and also and provide uh, legal support and compliance. So what then is in the investment policy? Uh, the investment policy outlines the types of investments allowed and, uh, and investment manager restrictions in meeting the return targets. May also have a cash flow guideline expectations uh, to be able to map out periodic payments that are required to be availed to the fund at periodic intervals. Uh, that will be then appreciated through the withdrawal policy, which establishes the amount the organization is permitted to take out of the fund at each period or installment based on the needs of the organization or the amount of the fund. And then of course, perhaps the usage policy 
which identifies defined purpose and ensures grant making is adhering. Uh, stroke. Also, the investment policy is adhering to the purposes both appropriately and effectively. So, the endowment trustees um, may uh, their core purpose will be to hold, invest, reinvest, and distribute uh, endowment funds as directed by the board to act as custodian. But this custody role, because they can't hold the cash in their pockets, they outsource that responsibility to a custodial bank to recommend to the executive board operating procedures for the effective management of the endowment, to develop, review, and recommend investment policies, strategies, and guidelines to the executive board where applicable, to select ind individual investment managers, and to report to the executive board and the council on the status of the endowment and communicate uh, perhaps, perhaps from time to time about the performance of the endowment. Now, guidelines for developing an investment policy for the endowment for sustainability is that an investment policy is usually drafted, uh, not necessarily by the auditor, apologies on that, but by a CFA or an actuary or an investment uh, professional and uh, then discussed by the fund manager in terms of the benchmarks as will be agreed by the uh, trustees. So the key responsibilities uh, of the trustees or the board of the endowment as regards to the investment policy development is to assess and quantify the risk profile of the fund and set out return profile based on the anticipated return in various asset classes, determine the liquidity requirements over a long period of time. And in terms of risks, the risk basically is the uncertainty that an investment may not uh, and its expected return, a rate of return over time. And there are nine rules of risk management. Uh, so the first one is that there is no return without risk. So you can never uh, have a zero. If you're going to play zero return, zero risk, then you'll uh, most likely to have um uh, zero return. And just to give you an example, for example, if you say, okay, I want all my cash to be, <laughs> I, I want all our assets to be in cash, then possibly you will have uh, near zero return because you don't want to take any risk. Number two, be transparent. Um, three, seek uh, expert advice. That's important. Or know what you don't know. Um, communicate because it, there are always changes in the environment. Five, diversification is key or six. Remain disciplined. Uh, sometimes I find emotions playing out whenever we have volatilities, but it helps to remain uh, uh, disciplined to your course of purpose. When you are loyal to your vision, your vision provides. Use common sense. Return is only half the equation. And uh, you should not really uh, overly be um, anxious and pushing higher return at the expense of your core purpose. You've got to check around sometimes um, are you earning that return ethically within the confines of your ethical policy as regards to investments? So where do you get this return? Generally speaking, you can get um, return through your underlying assets. And this can be shares. So shares, you get dividend income. If it is bonds you, or fixed income securities, you'll get interest income. If it is real estate, then you'll have uh, 
rental income and then if it is um, through properties and also through uh, shares, the stock market, you may also get capital appreciation. The concern around liquidity is how quickly can an asset be converted into cash? And that's why uh, it helps so that you are not overly um, excited to put, um, to be so weighty, uh, uh, to be so much exposed into um, uh, properties so that at the point you really need your cash, you are not able to get your cash. Now, trustees' responsibilities or the board's responsibilities in investment management is establish your investment strategy to meet your objectives. Um, and in this, I mean to invest the funds prudently, the strategy must take into consideration the nature and term of the underlying liabilities, aim to optimize returns, maximize returns at an appropriate level of risk, diversification of the assets to minimize risks, select, investments that produce returns even in inflationary conditions and reasonably above inflation, and then investments to be reasonably marketable and acceptable. The other considerations is regulatory environment, custody and safety of the assets is key. Look at also the overall expenses and generally, the expense ratio could be a max of 2%, but between 1% to 2% uh, is an ideal. And um, the cash flow requirements, and would you say your fund manager, would he have discretionary mandate or non-discretionary investment mandate? The guidelines to the fund manager is trustees to allocate assets between different asset classes based on the risk return profile, and the allocation takes into consideration the expected returns, risk profile, and also liquidity. So how does the um, investment uh, process then happen? So you have the investment um, um you have the investment policy, and from the investment policy, you have the asset allocation, which the fund manager would uh, take into consideration. Um, and then there is a specific security selection. Then the fund manager will construct the portfolio, and there will be risk control and also compliance. And in here, you consistently are having research and you're having uh, uh, adapt adaptability to the realities of the changing uh, environment. So how then do you uh, develop an investment policy? Uh, just to quickly run us through. Um, the investment policy statement is a roadmap in it, investors specify the types of risk they are willing to take and their investment costs and constraints. Because investor needs change over time, the investment statement policy statement must be periodically reviewed and updated. Ideally, uh, this will be probably within three years, the investment policy uh, is recommended has to be uh, reviewed. However, annually, there need to be checks whether you are in line. So annually, but reasonably reviewed uh, three after three years. So the investment policy statement, this the investment policy statement is a written uh, document that spells out the trustees' objectives as they re relate to investments. We The short form of the investment policy statement is IPS provides the foundation for the investment management process, sets out the client uh, special expectations and needs, serves as the governing document for all investment decision making, and clearly specifies 
uh, the stakeholder roles. And why is it important? Because it, it's a, it, it sets out clarity of understanding of investment goals, objectives, and, re, and, and restrictions. Assets are structured and invested in a prudent manner. A clear and rigorous process for the evaluation of investment strategies and assets classes used to achieve the investment objectives. Governance policies are understood and implemented as guided by the uh, governance bodies at the endowment level. And also compliance guidelines in the framework of legislation meet obligations to beneficiaries to understand and articulate investor goals, to set standards for evaluating portfolio performance through inclusion of benchmarks, to protect the client against unsuitable investments, and to help articulate realistic goals and needs. So generally speaking, um, there has to be uh, ownership by trustees uh, or the board uh, of the endowment in terms of uh, the whole process of development of uh, the investment policy. But the need again is to, the need for a policy statement is basically to understand and articulate investor goals. I can't belabor that, I think I have already gone through that. Generally, the contents of the investment policy will have a brief plan description purpose of for establishing policies and guidelines, duties and investment responsibilities of parties involved, statement of uh, go investment goals, considerations to be taken into account, um, like strategic asset allocations, investment strategies and styles, portfolio rebalancing guidelines, and schedule for review of investment performance as well as uh, the investment policy is, itself. So um, at this point, you also want to balance out the investment objective return. You have to balance, for example, money market, the risk is low, but the return will be lower, generally speaking. And then you come to uh, fixed income securities, which are like government bonds, the risk could be relatively higher than money market, but the return is higher. Balance fund would be now a mix of shares and um, uh, and government securities, so the risk is higher relatively, and then the return might be higher in the long run. Pure stocks or shares, equities, the risk is higher. Maybe I'll downgrade the um, the risk on land and uh, property. I'll bring it down to the level of uh, fixed income securities at the moment. Uh, in this case, um, so land will be lower. Uh, allow me to rework that down to the level of uh, uh, fixed income securities at the moment. Private equities and private uh, alternative assets will be much higher in terms of the um, risk profile. So um, I think just generally speaking, you'll have to align when you are investing, align your objectives to your risk appetite to how long you are going to invest. And all this then will be appreciated in your investment policy uh, guided by the uh, your investment objectives. So like I did say earlier on, for shares, you get capital appreciation and dividend. For interest-bearing uh, assets, you get interest income and cash flow. Property, you get income and rental income and also uh, capital appreciation. But you can also have um, guaranteed funds and also the investment, uh, or like private equities and agri funds as well. So uh, in terms of uh, portfolio construction, you will determine your um, uh, objectives, risk uh, tolerance, liquidity. You look at uh, what are investment con constraints. And in this case, this generally goes with your ethical issues. Maybe no investments in uh, 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 alcohol, 
no investment maybe in uh, 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 guns, uh, companies that do guns, or no investments on in, uh, stocks that destroy environment, uh, or no investments. It depends with your ethical issues, which you can set out there. And then also you then construct your portfolio and then you have uh, monitoring as is. And so this is just a sample. You may consider risk return. So conservative, you may have 20% shares, 80% uh, fixed income securities. Moderate, you may have 35% shares and 65% fixed income securities. Balance will be 50-50. And you can always adapt this, by the way. Growth may be 65% uh, stocks and that's really, really aggressive, 80% as, as it is. Okay. Um, now, in the investment policy, I think I already mentioned that uh, um, you look at uh, time horizon, liquidity, uh, regulatory taxation, and other constraints. In terms of the asset allocation, um, it is helpful to know that your asset allocation de uh, determines 90% of the returns that you make. So that is very key. And that has to do with where to invest, how to invest, and how much you have to invest. Basically, that's under asset allocation is where you determine your uh, diversification strategy. So the three stages of asset allocation process uh, strategic asset allocation has to do with long-term apportionment of funds between various assets classes. Number two, tactical asset allocation, short-term movements away from desired long-term asset allocation. And then you go to the number three, the security selection or the stock selection itself. Now, uh, where to invest? This will be a very key one for you to know. So equities, they give you dividend uh, uh, and, and uh, dividend income. Asset class on um, uh, equities, you get dividend. Volatility is uh, high, but liquidity is moderate and suitability uh, basically is short term to long term. Fixed income securities, you get interest income, and that is where government securities are. So uh, volatility is low, but uh, the liquidity provision is moderate to high, and suitability will be short term and to lo and long term investors. Mutual funds, you get capital appreciation and interest income and dividend. Volatility is low and liquidity uh, is uh, moderate to high, and then suitability short-term and long-term investors. Private equities, you get capital appreciation, capital gains, and dividend income, but volatility is relatively high. I must change that. It's relatively high, private equity, uh, but uh, also liquidity is li relatively low because they lock you in for a long uh, a period, and stability is long-term investors. Real estate, you get rental income and capital appreciation. Volatility is relatively stable. Uh, volatility is stable and uh, liquidity is low to moderate, moderate and suitable for long-term investors. You can also have structured funds as well. Um, and this maybe can be uh, agri-funds or specialized uh, products which can be targeting a certain sector and and that also determines with how it's structured. Uh, it will give you capital gains, interest income or dividend. You can have a mix of debt. Uh, you can have a mix of, of equity in those structured funds. And then you end up with a bit of low to moderate volatility and also liquidity is high. Anyway, so Key factors that may impact on investments is politics, state of the economy, financial markets, and also social e uh, issues. Um, then the key benefits of um, asset clear asset allocation is 
and uh, is reduces investment risk through diversifying your portfolio across assets, minimizes the level of risk of loss from investing in any one single class. Number two is optimizes uh, returns. Proper asset allocation helps in optimizing your returns on your investment for risk for risk you assume. Helps in being attuned to your financial goals depending on your time horizon. Um, and then makes market uh, timing irrelevant because you have uh, spread your asset allocation. You can also have um, a tax optimization strategy through your investments by choosing uh, tax exempt investments like uh, tax exempt infrastructure bonds and also uh, addressing your investor uh, liquidity needs. I think with that, I want to, we have some 10 minutes. Uh, here are our conduct. Should you have any needs around uh, designing um, an investment policy, we can assist you with a sample and probably uh, to, through KCDF, we can uh, work together to help you formulate your investment policy statements for your endowment. Uh, in Kenya, we've had a long history of fraudulent CFAs and uh, investment managers. Uh, you've mentioned clearly that the trustees will be able to more or less engage and mandate okay. CFAs and investment managers to run the endowment fund or investment. My question is, are there inherent safeguards against this type of occurrences, some regu regulatory body or regulatory statutory mechanisms are in place to support or protect, you know, instances of this nature for endowment funds. Thanks. I think, thank you so much uh, for that. What I wanted to say is this, that um, you have to ensure that the fund manager you select, can you see the screen? Yes, Simon. Can you see? Yes, yes, you have to please. ensure that the fund manager you select is uh, approved by the Capital Markets Authority. And then number two, I did mention that the custodian you select is also licensed to provide uh, custodial services, uh, usually is a license from the capital markets. And then also the assets that you select, you have to be intentional that uh, you are professionally guided. And the whole essence of this particular governance framework is also to ensure that the role of the fund manager and custodian, there is separation of roles to enhance transparency and accountability. Uh, and then finally, uh, like I did indicate that the, the fund manager doesn't hold the money. The funds are sitting in a nominee account with the custodial bank. So the work of the fund manager is to do research and do security selection based on the investment policy statement approved by the trustees. And then they only give instructions to the custodian and say, sell this or buy this uh, within the confines of the investment policy. I think uh, that's the much I would say. And I would say that this model has worked very well in the unit trust uh, approved schemes. And also it has worked so well uh, also in the retirement benefit sector. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Simon, for the response. We can see the second hand is up and it's Abiba Ahmed. So Abiba, can you unmute yourself and proceed? Good morning, Mr. Bwire and uh, everybody else on the on, on this meeting. Thank you for giving me the chance. I was wondering, uh, as, a, as, a, as a trustee, would we be, if, if we were to select a board of trustee, would they be compelled to sign an indemnity? Um, I... It's a very fundamental question. Um, so what happens is that your service providers that you appoint must have an indemnity, professional indemnity cover, uh, but also then you'll have to procure a trustee liability cover. And that also, that insurance policy cover does exist. 
but it has to do with your obligations underlying with the various uh, donor relationships. Because if there are reasonable commercial value, then it helps that you would also want to risk mitigate by procuring a trustee liability cover as well. So it's a valid observation.